I want to welcome everybody. I'm Kylie with Return to Zero Hope. I'm the founder, and I'm excited today to be co-hosting this webinar panel, um, talking about the journey of these women who have experienced loss within the military community and what that looks like and the unique challenges that they faced. So thank you, Anita, for putting this together. Anita is um, our one of our community support coordinators, and she is a military spouse. So this is a topic that's very near and dear to her heart. Um, and I'm here with Betsy Winter, who's our Director of Community Support. She's going to help co-facilitate this panel discussion. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, Emily, Miranda, Amanda, and Heather, who have volunteered to come and share their experiences with loss while being in the military. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm just going to start by asking, um, each of you to briefly introduce yourself and then share your story of loss. So why don't we start with Emily? Hello, thank you so much for having me um, here. Um, I'm Emily Fortney. I am a clinical psychologist and have my own um, telehealth private practice. And I've been a military spouse for the past 10 years. My husband, Ryan, um, is a major in the Air Force, and we are currently stationed in Buenos Aires, Argentina, um, so far away from the States, um, but it's been an awesome assignment so far, um, and I'm just really happy to be here. Um, now, I'll kind of share my lost story, and even though it's been five years, <laughs> I can't help but get choked up. Um, so. Um, just bear with me as I kind of share, share my story. Um, I tried to be as concise as possible, but it's just, it's hard, you know? Um, so on December 22nd, 2017, we were on our way to Spain for a baby moon. I was 18 weeks pregnant and I started miscarrying on our flight from Atlanta to our connecting flight in New York City. Um, I vividly remember going to the bathroom on the plane and having golf ball sized clots coming out of me. I returned to my seat and told my husband, we have to get off this plane and go to a hospital as soon as we land. We both were completely stunned, panicked, had no idea where to go or, or where we were. I remember standing in line for the taxis and something kind of divine came over me to say, please take me to the best maternity hospital like in the local area. The young taxi driver said, my wife just gave birth a few weeks ago and this certain hospital is a little bit of a drive. Is that okay? And we said, absolutely. And later on, we found out that I ended up being at the number one high-risk pregnancy hospital like in the area. It was one of several divine moments during this unbelievably devastating experience. When we arrived, none of the doctors knew what was happening with me. Eliza, our daughter, looked great on ultrasound and the bleeding ultimately like decreased. We felt hopeful. However, I spent the next two weeks in the hospital in New York City away from all my friends and all my family. We were stationed in Mississippi at the time. Ultimately, a doctor ended up finding a kiwi-sized mast that was protruding from my cervix and it looked cancerous. Thankfully, after the end of um, my time in the hospital, we found out that that was not the case. It was not cancerous, but it was two weeks of complete hell and turmoil. So many tests, so many unknowns, so many meetings with so every medical team imaginable. It was a constant emotional roller coaster of, will my baby girl be okay? Will I be okay? Will we both survive? I remember feeling so unbelievably tired and when I would try to stay positive, something really deep inside me told me this specific story would not have a happy ending. On January 2nd, the bleeding increased and the ultrasound showed that I actually had no amniotic fluid left. Come to find out later, I had a very slow leak, premature rupture of the membranes that was caused by the mass and no one caught it. I will never forget that last ultrasound 
As soon as I saw it, I knew that we had lost her. The doctor solemnly told us that we had to make a decision to terminate the pregnancy as there was less than a 10% chance of survival, and I was at risk of going into sepsis. They told Ryan and I that they didn't recommend a vaginal birth because of how large the mass was and the potential blood loss. I'll never forget my husband, Ryan, looking at me, bawling his eyes out, saying, Emily, I can't lose you too. We knew the direction we had to go in go in and we made the decision to terminate the pregnancy together. Fortunately, her heart stopped beating the following day and so that made that decision feel a little bit easier. However, a few days later, I had to have the most traumatic surgery of my life and it still haunts me to this day. Did we do enough? Did we make all of the right decisions? I was 19 weeks and five days when we lost her. The flight home to Mississippi and back to our military community was unreal and a complete daze. The weeks and months to follow were a blur as we returned to work and back to quote unquote normal life. As the pregnancy hormones slowly left my body and the mass decreased considerably, I was able to have it removed in June of 2018. We were then given the green light to try again for a baby if we felt ready and we did. And soon after, I became pregnant with my now three-and-a-half-year-old son, Benjamin. The pregnancy was filled with anxiety and so many trauma-related symptoms. But in the end, we had a beautiful birth and a very healthy boy. I wish this was the end of my lost story, but unfortunately, I went on to have two missed miscarriages around 10 weeks, pregnant in January and May of 2021. Return to Zero and their lost support group were crucial parts of my healing journey. Just like in 2018, 2021 ended up being a huge year of growth and transformation. As they say, out of the ashes comes new life. Ultimately, I'm a better person because of Eliza and all the losses that I have had. She has transformed me in so many ways that I cannot even fully articulate. She has made me a better mother and a better person, and I do not take one day for granted with my son, not one. It doesn't mean I enjoy the hard parts of parenting, but it reframes how I react and how I manage my own emotions. I'm overwhelmed with gratitude, and my story is still being written as I'm now 31 weeks pregnant with another boy. I'm still so incredibly anxious, but there is a different sense of presence and freedom in this pregnancy. I think about Eliza and our losses all the time, and I'm just so aware of how you can hold joy and grief in the exact same space. And I hope that my short, my little story here can just share and spread hope to others that may need it and that you're not alone and that, that we can all have happy endings. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Emily, sharing Eliza with us. Miranda, would you like to go next? Do you think the internet's okay? You want to try? Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for inviting us to be here. Uh, I'm Major Miranda Hernandez. Um, I've been in the Air Force coming up on 19 years. Um, and just over five years ago, my son, Adrian, was still born. Um, um, my story is a little bit different. Um, I was actually single when I became pregnant. Uh, I I was in my early 30s and I just hadn't met the right partner. And I decided to have a child on my own. So I um, actually used donor sperm, got pregnant on the very first try. And something that stands out to me about that moment is I was literally at uh, Disney World when I found out I was pregnant. And went and bought um, a onesie with Thumper on it. And it, it's something I, I always remember, like that just moment of happiness in the beginning. Um, I won't say pregnancy is easy, but it did feel like I didn't have any more difficulties or complications than the average person. Um, I had morning sickness and lower back pain. And during my third trimester, I had a lot of swelling. Uh, I brought all of this up to my providers at the time, and they told me everything was normal. And being a first-time parent, I, I didn't know any better. Um, in June of 2017, I was nine months pregnant. 
um, I had gained 50 pounds. Um, I was swollen in my hands and my face. And I was experiencing um, a lot of nausea and pain underneath my right ribs. And I again reported all of this to my providers and they continued to tell me everything was normal, um, even when my blood pressure started to climb. And I really wish I had known more than or known um, to ask more questions um, because I know now that all of these symptoms are, are strongly indicative of preeclampsia. Um, but because my providers weren't concerned, um, I allowed my pregnancy to continue up until, up until my due date and then passed it. Um, I remember that last week pretty clearly. Um, I was doing all the things you do to get ready for a baby. Um, I was talking to and writing letters to my son. I was putting the final touches on the nursery. And I remember going to bed the night before I would have hit 41 weeks and my son was kicking in my belly and I was just happy. And by the time I woke up the next morning, he was dead. Um, I was induced and I gave birth to him at um, San Antonio Military Medical Center. And while that experience isn't one I think anyone should ever have to go through, I do want to say that, that the team at that hospital did everything possible to make it more bearable. Um, I, I always have to say the nurses in particular were some of the most amazing and sweet people. And I, I will always remember that. Um, one of the things that really stands out to me is that the nurses were the first people to call me mama. And I don't know if I would have, I don't know if I would have accepted that, that term without them. Um, and then I went home to an empty house and a fully furnished nursery and tried to make some kind of sense out of my life. And something else that I want to say that I'm really grateful for is how supportive my leadership team was during that time. I know a lot of people don't have that. Um, so I'm I'm aware of, of how lucky I was and how much that helped. And I also wanna say that it's it shaped a large part of who I've become as a leader. Um, these are the things that, that I think about when people come to me um, with difficult situations now. Um, and then about five months later, um, I was able to PCS to a new assignment, which is both easier and harder <laughs> in many ways. Um, and I received training to take on an entirely new job, which I'm doing today. And when I struggled there, I also had good leadership. And I think all of this really just brings home to me how much of a family the military can be. Um, and I'm really thankful for that. Thanks for sharing your story, Miranda. Amanda, would you like to go next? Yes, so uh, first, thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to share my story. I found at least on my grief journey that um, speaking my truth and talking about my story has helped um, in my uh, personal recovery. And then I've also find, uh, have found that it, it reaches other people who sometimes do the taboos surrounding child loss, um, uh, have had difficulty embracing their own grief and their own stories. Um, so again, my name is Amanda Rebhe and I am an active duty major in the Air Force, currently stationed in the National Capital Region. And um, roughly two years ago, I lost my daughter, Liliana, um, and she had been our miracle baby. We were going on almost a decade of trying to have a child, and actually, we were starting IVF, and I wasn't getting my cycle, and I was like, come on, <laughs> we have to get this done before we PCS and move. Um, and lo and behold, I was pregnant um, with our miracle baby. Um, and uh, moving through that pregnancy, everything was great. All the genetic tests came back um, perfectly normal. 
everything was progressing as expected. Uh, found out that it was a girl, which I was thrilled because we had Liliana Beatrice picked out as a name for uh, over a decade from the time that we had been dating. And I was finally going to have my Lily B. Um, but around 15 weeks, I started having light bleeding and I was going into the, the Army Hospital at my new location here in the National Capital Region. And um, I kept being told everything's normal. Oh, it's just cervical cyst. Cervical cyst has popped and that's why you're bleeding. Um, I come from a, a family with my parents being in um, medicine and um, uh, I have all that kind of background knowledge and even still asking the questions I was being coached to ask and going in whenever there was something that was going wrong. Um, I continued to uh, have my concerns ignored um, as the bleeding progressed from just light bleeding to clots, uh, golf ball sized clots. They said, no, bleeding is normal in pregnancy. Um, and that continued uh, to the point where when my water broke one night and I went to the ER, the ER turned me away. Um, because that doctor had a problem with me um, having come in, quote, too many times. Um, and he never checked to see if my water had broken. Um, I only found out two weeks later that that was when I had suffered P prom or uh, premature rupture of the membranes. Um, and so I was also having a placental abruption and the bleeding progressed from small clots to like baseball, softball sized clots until um, one night I, uh, uh, it, eventually called the Walter Reed and their emergency room to say, would you guys see me? Would I ever see an OB if I come to your location? Because I'm not getting to OB when I go to the ER um, at the Army Hospital. And uh, they said, come on in. By the time I got there, I had blood through my clothes. Um, and they found that there was absolutely no amniotic fluid at that point. Um, but my daughter was still alive and looking healthy. Um, I chose to continue with the pregnancy um, because I wasn't going to give up on my daughter. I really thought that uh, if anyone could pull through, I could pull through, <laughs> um, despite me knowing that the likelihood was extremely slim. Um, and I eventually made it uh, just shy of 20 weeks. And um, I had eventually been discharged. I went home. The bleeding had stopped. And then the bleeding picked up again. I went back to Walter Reed and found, found that the cord had prolapsed, um, which meant that there was no coming back. Um, so I waited for my daughter to die and then I gave birth to her. Um, and that was three days shy of 20 weeks. So I had essentially gone five weeks being gaslighted and ignored um, and maybe I would have lost my daughter anyways, but part of um, the process of grief and accepting this is the fact that I'll never actually know if I had gotten better care, if doctors had listened to me, if doctors had checked, if they had, you know, uh, you know put me on bed rest when I first started showing slight signs of bleeding. Um, and uh, part of that, I say, like, I wonder if I hadn't been in the military with a prescribed doctor and having to go to this facility, would her chances have been better? Um, and then naturally going through the grief process on your own in a new city. Uh, it was the 2020, so middle of COVID lockdowns and had no one, uh, no one here for support, no friends that we had made in the area. Um, so that was some of the unique challenges that I faced, but um, uh, happy to talk a little bit more about those challenges as we continue on this. Thank you, Amanda, for sharing your story, for sharing about Liliana. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you and Miranda right, were both not listened to. Heather, should we try? Heather's yes. internet is not working great, so we'll see if we can get through this. <laughs> if I spontaneously drop off, I apologize in advance. Um, my name is Heather. I am a Army National Guard veteran and a current Air Force um, spouse. Um, we're stationed in England and I 
run um, an awesome grief community, Wellness and Grief, uh, mostly on Instagram, but that's also my website and blog. So come join me over there. I'd love to share part of my story or really Miles' story um, because it's become like such a huge part of my identity. So our son Miles uh, died on April 23rd, 2019 during labor at our home birth while stationed in Florida. I always wanted a home birth, but was unaware of the risks that one can carry. Uh, I was laboring for 37 hours, but my midwives were never starting conversations with us about hospital transfer, which should have happened since I was already 42 weeks pregnant and the risk of stillbirth was increasing with every passing hour. Unfortunately, when my midwife remembered to check on the baby, uh, she said his heart tones were low, but I think she was picking up my heartbeat on the handheld Doppler and that he had already passed away. Uh, she put me on oxygen and called 911. Of course, my laboring story for 37 hours is a lot longer than that, but I'll spare you some of those details. Um, the ambulance didn't allow my midwife, my doula, or even my husband to ride along with me to the hospital. So I was alone in the Fort Long Beach Hospital, um, which I'd never been to before, <laughs> in a room full of strangers, I think prepped to uh, send me to an emergency C-section when I learned that Miles had died before I could even get any medical care at that hospital. I was 38 years old at the time, so I was considered advanced maternal age. I was 42 weeks pregnant and should have not been allowed to have a home birth at that point, which I did not know. My water had been broken for eight hours and there was light meconium in the amniotic fluid. When I arrived at the hospital, they declared me as having preeclampsia and needed to be on a magnesium drip for 10 hours before the induction of my delivery could be restarted. Um, that was to prevent me from having a seizure or a stroke. Um, so my life was definitely at risk at this time as well. Um, when I finally birthed Miles, the nuchal cord was wrapped around his neck two times tightly. Um, so there's never a clear stated reason for his death, um, but there are plenty of complications that could have led to him dying. And that hospital actually denied me um, an autopsy, which is really unfortunate. Right before Miles' first birthday, we had moved back to California where we were stationed um, for the following 18 months. This move was both good and hard, um, good to get away from where all the tragedy and trauma happened, but also incredibly hard because the friends and support we had cultivated in Florida, um, we were leaving behind and a piece of us felt like we were leaving Miles behind there too. But we had his ashes with us and we'll talk about that more later. Um, and he got to drive my SUV that was being pulled behind our Penske truck all the way across the country. Uh, the lucky boy got the driver's seat view. After 18 months in California, we were stationed in England a year ago. Um, once again, leaving behind our friends and a place that we had um, considered home because this was the place where my husband and I met 10 years earlier because the military does that sometimes, sends you back and forth to bases where amazing memories are made. But I can't help but wonder if we'll be sent back to Florida where all the trauma took place. Um, also while well in California in 2020 during COVID, we welcomed our second child and she just turned 18 months old. Um, journey, journeying through parenting after loss and moving overseas when she was only six months old was so hard, so stressful. And I felt like we were completely alone at that point in this journey of parenting a dead son and now an infant living daughter. Um, we've gotten our bearings here, but still feel isolated living here and are in the middle of moving houses literally this week. <laughs> and it just seems to never end. Um, the constant feeling of uprooting and reestablishing military life alone is hard. Adding deep grief in the mix uh, takes a level of strength I never imagined I would need to muster. Yet, here we are. So thanks for that chance to share. Thank you so much, Heather. So I want to thank all of you again for sharing your stories. Um, there's a lot of hard parts to it, and I'm just sorry for not only your losses, but the the other traumatic experiences that came from healthcare providers not being listened to and that type of stuff. So I'm sorry. Um, 
We're going to next talk about challenges that are unique to having a loss within the military or married to someone in the military. So I'm going to ask each of you to just share one challenge that you think is maybe the biggest challenge that you particularly faced. Um, and and we'll go from there. So um, let's start. I'm going to start with Amanda on this one. Amanda, what is what is kind of the biggest challenge that you face that's unique to the military? Right. I think um, uh, in my story, the, the challenge of care is definitely one that is highlighted um, and the inability to really choose your provider for something that is such an intimate part of life. But the challenges post loss have been um, just as difficult when you're laying in a hospital bed and you have the casualty assistance team come into your room, especially when you're at a military base, which uh, a lot of um, women will be uh, because of their military association. Um, hearing things like your daughter doesn't qualify as a child um, because we were three days shy of the arbit arbitrary 20 week snap line um, to have FSGLI or the Family Service Members Group Life Insurance cover her loss. Um, never being told that I had burial options at Arlington National Cemetery or other military cemeteries and we're sitting going, Where, what are we going to do with our daughter? I have to figure out what we do with her body. Um, and you're making that decision that you've never had to think through <laughs> before right then and there. Um, and so we chose to cremate our daughter despite um, my husband's uh, uh, cultural beliefs and our preferences because we weren't informed that we could have buried her at Arlington. We have gone through that process now. It took two years um, to um, get her accepted and then um, uh, buried at Arlington. Um, but if we had not cremated her, that process could have been a few weeks. Um, but that's just one of those things you have to try to think about. Um, and when you're in that post-loss state and they tell you you don't get time off, the only reason I got time off from military is because of the um, the birth recovery and the fact that I had lost half of my blood. So I got three weeks to recover on convalescent leave. Um, I know that last year the NDAA did pass uh, bereavement leave, but in cases like mine, when it is prior to 20 weeks, that might not count, uh, just like it didn't count for FSGLI. Um, so uh, yes, there are some positive benefits uh, to having great commanders and leadership who just say, take the time that you need, but what is written into the rules and the processes that the military follows um, can definitely leave you feeling less than supported in your greatest moment of need. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Emily, would you go next? Sure, I would say, um... For me, as a military spouse, like one of the major challenges has been, you know, we have moved six times in the last like eight years and post loss, you know, wanting to try for like a baby again and everything like constantly changing assignments. I'm having to go find new doctors, find ones that, um, and manage a high risk pregnancy and like constantly have to share my story over and over. And, and with my first loss with like Eliza, we had no idea that they put me on the exceptional family member program till we were having to PCS to our next assignment in California. And a lot of the military individuals will know like kind of about that program. It's a really great program, like when you like need it, but also you have to have like an interview and things to try to get off of it. And it impacts like your next assignments. And so the amount of times that I had to talk to doctors and people and just relive the trauma each time, um, it's just super hard and having to just find the right kind of care too. 
um, you know, from Mississippi to California to Arlington, Virginia, and now Buenos Aires, Argentina. I mean, those are completely different medical uh, uh, systems. And so I think my biggest challenge has been just trying to find the right care, the right people, and having to constantly retell and relive um, my all my losses. Thank you, Emily. Heather, would you go next? Yes. Um, I don't know if this is like the military to blame or my midwives to blame, but like the medical record system. So I started at the local military hospital, but then because I wanted a home birth, I had to go with local midwives. That was pretty seamless, but because of my advanced maternal age being 38, um, the military hospital was like, we want you to see an MFM, maternal fetal medicine. And I did get some advanced care with that. Um, but what happened at the MFM, which I wasn't aware of, was he, I don't know why he didn't tell, I mean, I've been told that this is typical, but he didn't tell us, the parents, um, that his recommendation was to induce by 40 weeks because of my age. And um, those, then my midwives didn't get those records. They were like depending on me to work harder to try to get those records. And I'm just like, I'm pregnant and busy. Like, why is this falling on me? That is their job. But they claim that they never got that piece of information. And had I been induced at, you know, 39 or 40 weeks, like Miles would have never died because he died at 42 weeks at home. And that just like kills me that it was a matter of, you know, MFM medical records not getting into the hands of my midwives. And I don't know what the breakdown was. And so that's just, that's hard to swallow. That's hard to, you know, like live with. And, you know, maybe it's, I do take responsibility for going out of the military hospital system and having a home birth, but at the same time, um, those options should be open to us wherever we go and live. Um, so that's my example for this question. Thank you, Heather. Miranda. Would you share with us? Yes. I, I think the the other panelists have, have covered a lot of things that um, I, I want to agree with. Um, I would take mine in, in a little bit of a different direction and say, like, well, the majority of the people that I worked with were um, pretty amazing after my son died. There's also kind of that um, expectation in the military that when things are hard, you just like suck it up and and move through it. And there were definitely a small minority of people who kind of had that attitude, who maybe couldn't understand um, what I was going through or feeling, or um, maybe the perception that I was getting special treatment. So I, I think that that's that's probably something that happens everywhere, but maybe a bit more so in the military. Um, uh, just another um, echo of that. This this past year, um, my son would have turned five, and I've I've taken the days surrounding his birthday um, off of work every year. Um, this was the first year that I had difficulty doing that, and I think part of it was because I was working for a supervisor who didn't have children. Um, and just didn't get it, like thought that I was being um, extreme to want that time off. Thank you. That's a challenge, I think, everywhere, right? Like, yeah, people not understanding, and it's such an important day to us. Thank you all. Um, I then I want to move to deployment or relocation. So how have you all handled that? So that could, um, you know, you could speak to one thing. This could be traveling with your baby's memorabilia or your baby's remains, community, support system. Right? Some of you have mentioned medical providers. So if you just want to pick one thing, one, I mean, one or two things that have to do with kind of 
how you handled it and the challenges that might have come up. So let's do, um, I'm just randomly picking people. Heather, do you wanna go next? Sure. Um, <laughs> so when my mom died, I was working, I mean, I've been working as a civilian for a long time, but my employer gave me a $200 Amazon gift card. <laughs> I was like, thank you. I don't know. So I thought I should use the money for something like death related. So I bought his urn on Amazon. And can I share it with you? <laughs> it's this huge like shoe box, wooden box with a tree on it. And it's way too big. So baby's ashes come in a snack size Ziploc bag after you cremate them. And it's about that big. So I just stuff all of his things in there. All of his like little things from the hospital little memories remade while I was pregnant. Um, I think the onesie that he wore in the hospital after I birthed him was in there. Um, but then we moved to England and I was like, well, I'm not going to take this huge box like in my luggage. So then I folded his ashes like really neatly in this beautiful cloth napkin and tied it with like some twine. And like that came with me because I was like, I'm not going to be separated from the only like physical I have and so and then you pack his, the rest of his box and you don't see it for three months and then you hear these horror stories of PCS seeing and like losing stuff you know completely and so you're just kind of like have this underlying anxiety of like are the rest of his like things these very very few things gonna actually make it and then they do and you unpack your silverware, then the next box you open is like your dead kid stuff. So it's kind of, um, you know, screws with your mind a little bit, but it's so ingrained in us to just roll with moving all over the place in the military. So it's like this weird strength and resilience that almost normalizes all of that. I, I mean, as much as it can be, it's like, well, yeah, you shove your whole life in boxes and move across the world. So I'm just going to shove my dead kid stuff in a box too. And I'm not trying to laugh, but it's also like, yes, I, you know, life with all this like trauma and tragedy is, is sometimes like, I don't even know. Um, so it's nice to have his things, but it's also, it's hard. And one other thing I wanted to share is we didn't do a funeral or anything, but we did a plaque in um, this is specifically for child loss in Florida. And so we're able to visit that as kind of like maybe uh, another memory. So that's forever in Florida. And then we've had friends who are like passing through the area, stop by and surprise us. And we have friends who still live there and stop by and take a picture of the plaque and say, oh, we visited. So it's like, you feel like you're leaving all those people behind, but they still remind you, like they think of your child and there's a physical space they can go. And I just love that. I'm really glad that space exists in Florida. That's beautiful. And I think going back to laughing, like humor is part of this. Um, I think it's, we need it to get us through. So, hmm, thank you. Um, let's see, Amanda, would you like to go next? So I haven't moved since my loss, um, and I know that I'll be here at least another four years because I got picked up for a local program, um, and a part of me is like, I'm not leaving because my daughter's at Arlington, <laughs> so if you want to leave me, then you're making me get out, but I don't know if I'd really have that kind of hardline stance because I think I'm a gypsy at heart, um, and um, it's difficult having put her in a permanent location that I have to leave um, compared to the like almost two years that I had her ashes in my house and I could just spend time with her now I have to drive and even that it being here still local um, is sometimes difficult so that's where the memorabilia and things I think really come into place because now you can have something in your home for your child because any living child would have things in your home, right? And still be a part of your family. Um, for me, the the difficult part came with a deployment. So uh, I had actually competed for this deployment opportunity and received it prior to me ever getting pregnant. Um, and by the time the deployment came around, it was 
uh, just shy of a year um, from my loss. So uh, the deployment was to Florida. So it wasn't like I was overseas um, or somewhere difficult, but uh, the challenge I faced in that was my grief counseling. Um, I had been uh, seeking grief counseling um, on the economy in my own pocket um, since losing my daughter. And I had a good established rapport with this provider. Um, but because I was going to Florida where she is not licensed, even though I'd never met her in person and everything had been virtual, um, I couldn't continue my care. And again, it goes back to that reliving your your trauma and your loss with new providers. So um, for that deployment, I had to switch to someone else who was certified to practice in the state of Florida, which to me was a slap in the face because I'm like, I'm not here because I'm moving. I'm here because I'm deployed and this is short term. What if I did go overseas? Like, how would you treat me then? Um, and I think that's something military families will always face because of the moving and constantly needing to switch providers. And when it comes to that mental and emotional care, um, that's something that it is very delicate that is hard to just move around. Um, as much as physical care is difficult um, to go from provider to provider. So um, that really opened my eyes to some of the additional challenges um, that military can face especially in this type of situation and getting the mental health care that they need. Yeah, you make a great point. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Miranda, would you like to go next? I think um, the hardest part for me about moving other than just being worried about safeguarding all of my son's things is kind of having to like reestablish your identity and having to tell the story all over again. And like in my case, um, my first PCS, um, to all outward appearances, I looked like a single woman. Um, I wasn't married. I didn't have a living ch child with me. So I, I don't think anyone um, who I met like associated me as, as being a parent mm -hmm. um, and I didn't feel like I really fit in anywhere. So like trying, trying to find um, a place to belong. Um, and I think the only thing that really helped that was um, uh, where I was, was a, a pretty small community. We didn't have any, um, any formal support groups, but there was a, there was an informal one um, that someone invited me to, and and that really helped. Like just being being recognized as a parent by other people who understood. Thank you, Miranda. Emily. Um, yeah, so kind of how I've handled like relocating and all of that. Like I said, the challenging part is um in line with everyone else saying like reliving everything um but the establishing kind of like a community again um you know that's always like really hard and anxiety provoking and um you know i feel like every time we've moved kind of post loss you know with kind of my age and like the friend groups, like everyone is having children, like people are pregnant all the time. And I feel like for me, I've had to just be super open about my own loss on my losses and like my story just to kind of put it out there almost as like a way to like open up um, the doors of like that connection and communication. But also I think as a little bit of like a defense of like, please, please handle, handle with care, you know? Um, and so I think um, I've just, the support system piece that has been really um, tough. And then also at the same time, the more I have been open about my own lost story, the more I have met individuals in the military community that have also experienced um, loss. And so it's also created 
some meaningful uh, connections that way too. Um, but I've noticed for myself, like just being super open, it feels good for me to like, you know, talk about it too. It's healing. And then I also kind of realized it's like, hey, like, you know, everyone that's like pregnant and doing everything, like just handle with care a little bit, like as much as you can too, because it's so triggering, you know, so triggering. Thank you, Emily, for sharing, and each of you for sharing. There's some wise words within um, how you each have responded to deployments and relocation. It sounds quite challenging. And to end our webinar, before we do Q&A, we have um, want to create the space for you to be able to offer any advice to a parent who might currently be experiencing a loss within the military. Miranda, let's start with you. So I'm I'm actually going to steal something that was said to me at my last assignment. Um, it was about a year after my son died and I was really struggling and I was still trying to fit into that suck it up mentality and not be a burden. Um, and my supervisor at the time told me, the Air Force will survive if you don't pass this next test. They're not going to get rid of you. You don't have to be perfect. It's so much more important to the Air Force that you're here and that you take care of yourself. And that is something that I have seriously held on to for the past several years. Um, and, and that's the advice that I would give is take care of yourself and do what you need to do to get through the day. Um, and when you're ready, the work is going to be there, but you will always be more important than that work. Thank you. Powerful, powerful words. Amanda? So my personal advice, I think a lot of people have talked on, is to share your story. A lot of people can bottle things up, but you find that you're really not on an island. And I found actually a lot of commonalities with men who have said they've never shared their lost story or that they had a daughter or had a son um, because they were carrying the support for their spouse and they've just never opened up about it. So that has um, really been nice for me to see. Um, on the military specific policy type side, I do wanna hit on a couple things for people who might be out there. One, the NDAA changed last year for bereavement. That's not yet in um, regulation yet, but it should be by the end of this year, which would provide two weeks of bereavement leave for the loss of a child or a spouse. So that will be coming. Um, unfortunately, I don't know what the applicability is as far as pregnancy loss and different gestational cutoffs. Um, for the Air Force, the Women's initi Initiative Team has implemented changes for convalescent leave. So now there is a baseline floor to be able to take time off work based upon the gestation of your loss. As opposed to before, a lot of women received absolutely no time or had to beg for time. Um, now there are floors of uh, the minimum amount of time that they have to provide you um, for that physical and also emotional recovery. Um, and if you happen to be in a situation um, as either the service member or the spouse of a service member, and these things aren't necessarily covering your particular situation, there are so many tools that a commander can use in order to help that service member and take care of, the, of their people, alternate duty locations, telework, um, sometimes certain jobs, it's not always possible, but there is flexibility um, and good commanders will take care of their people and, and use those different tool sets. And lastly, um, if you lose a spouse or a child, a dependent child, your uh, 
your loved one, your spouse or your child is eligible to be buried in any military cemetery. It could be state cemeteries, can be Arlington National Cemetery, West Point, the, the academies, they, they all um, will accept your spouse or your dependent child. Um, and that's something that is just a, a, a bottom um, like expectation that you can have, that you know you can put your loved one to rest somewhere um, for free. Um, and not have to pay that funerary co cost for the burial. Incredible. And I appreciate Miranda recognizing your effort and helping make that happen. So immense gratitude to Amanda and all the others who have helped make that happen. Thank you. Heather? Yes. So I think my biggest piece of advice as hard as it's going to feel is um, set up and establish your mental health care. Um, I went almost immediately uh, and I'll share very briefly about my two very different experiences. So we're stationed, we're Air Force, I'm stationed on an Air Force base and there was a mental health facility on the base and that was phenomenal because everything's included, everything's confidential, you can go as many times as you want and this is a licensed psychiatrist, she, um, she happened to be civilian but there are I think some military members as well, I don't exactly know how it works but that was my experience. There's also MFLAC, and you don't have to put what the acronym means because I can't remember um this is a non-licensed person typically they i think their qualifications range we um saw one one time but i didn't um drive with her quite as well so there are, are sometimes different levels and different types of um, mental health care then we moved under a year later to an army base and so this is a totally different totally different experience so i'm with my primary care provider able to speak to her on the phone saying i need to continue my mental health and then their basic <laughs> i i don't think she could even give me a referral i'm trying to remember but at the end of the day what it came down to is me crawling through psychologytoday.com or psychology today, or psychology, I think that's right. And calling literally 15 different people saying, do you take TRICARE? And do you have an opening? And it was always no to one or the other. Like, yes, I take TRICARE. I have absolutely no openings. No, like most people do not take TRICARE. And in my case, I was pregnant, uh, pregnant, having a pregnancy after loss. And my therapist literally both of them were like, I'm full, but I'm going to make an exception for you. So sometimes you have to really like tell part of your story to all of these people so that they'll maybe make an exception. And I saw one for cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, um, for a while. And then in the end, I needed something more. And then I saw someone, um, EMDR therapy. And again, she was basically doing me a favor going, I don't want you to have a really rough time at the end of your pregnancy or in your labor and delivery like my biggest fear was I was going to like have a major anxiety attack and not really be able to recover and I was supposed to be delivering you know my next child um, so it's so important it's hard to do that deep work but it's been proven that if you do that deep work you will I don't believe in like healing grief but you can get to a place where you can shoulder it, I think a lot better. And then in-person support groups, if that's your thing. I found here in the UK, SANS um, Charity, Stillbirth and Neonatal Death Support. And then there's Tommy's as well. Those are the two main, um, if you happen to be stationed in the UK. Amazing, SANS, I go in person once a month. Um, or in the States, uh, Star Legacy Foundation, they're the number one. On stillbirth research foundation they have virtual groups so pregnancy after loss group i was in for several weeks before delivering anora and then they do a parenting um, after loss as well 
and then in California specifically, there's HAND, which is helping after neonatal death. There are uh, so many. And then one other I know for sure is Compassionate Friends. That's usually for people who lose older children. But like my mom went to that and she learned a lot um, as a grandparent. So highly recommend. I feel like my SANS in-person group here is like, it lifts me up. And I'm like, I just talked about dead babies for the last two hours, but I leave there feeling so good and so supported when I feel really isolated here and not necessarily making a ton of like American military friends, but it's like these people are like this, you know, not looking at me like the crazy American with the weird accent, but they're just like in partnership in grief. And that feels so good. Thank you, Heather. So many amazing resources. And I'll also offer Return to Zero Hope as well as an organization that does virtual support groups, parenting after loss, pregnancy after loss, termination for medical reasons, recurrent loss, infertility, pregnancy and infant loss for couples. Um, also, uh, just acknowledging Anita as one of our co-facilitators as well, or facilitator, so you possibly be in a group with her and have that military uh, perspective as well. And Heather, really appreciate all those other resources because as unfortunate as it is, this is so pervasive. Pregnancy and infant loss touches so many and we need all the resources and support we can put out there. So we need all these organizations doing the wonderful work that they're doing. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and I apologize for <laughs> leaving you out. I mean, how obvious. And um, I'm just so focused on the UK right now because, you know, some of these support groups grow, meet at like 8 p.m. Eastern and that's 1 a.m. or 3 a.m. for me and that's just not feasible. So it's like really find your local, um, if it's not virtual and you want to meet in person, that was kind of what I was trying to um, express. And the most important takeaway is find support. We all need support on this journey. And the other takeaway is you might need to try a bunch of different types of support to find the right fit for you, depending on what layer in your loss journey you're working with. Grief looks very different than the trauma piece. And the um, there's so many facets to these, to our losses. And so I appreciate the journey you've been on and the reflection of that so people can have permission to seek high and low try many options and listen to yourself on the journey and finding that support so, thank you um and emily finally what's your words of wisdom yes my uh biggest kind of piece of advice is i think sharing your story and like as a spouse having your spouse, if they're the active duty kind of service member, share the story like with um, like their commanders and everything. Like not only is it healing like for you and like as a family, but also the education piece. Um, we were, you know, that for our commanders at the time, like they were brand new commanders and everyone was unbelievably amazing and so supportive. Um, and I also think that we helped educate them on how people handle loss differently and grief differently. And I think that's something we really need to take into account in the military community. For example, you know, when we flew home, everything happened in New York City. When we flew back to Columbus, Mississippi, all my husband and I wanted to do was just hole away and like be in our home and everyone wanted to create a meal train and like all the amazing things that like the military community does, but we actually did not want that right away. And I think people were shocked that we didn't want like a meal train right away. We really wanted it like maybe a few weeks or like a month later. We just really didn't want to see anyone and we needed to just kind of like hole away like together. And I remember talking with um, some of the commanders later of like how that was like an educational moment for them too, that like not everyone grieves in the same way and that we need to ask like good questions in the military community of like, is this something that you need right now, even though during that time, we don't really know our needs. We're literally figuring them out 
on the go during this like traumatic experience. So I think like sharing your loss and like goes a long way in helping to like educate others for future kind of loss experiences. And then also just remembering that, you know, healing is not linear and grief is not linear. Um, once the initial shock and kind of trauma wears off, like things keep happening like months and and years later. And it's important to just kind of keep that in mind and um, just keep sharing, sharing your story as it kind of goes along. Thank you, Emily. And again, thank you to each of you for being here, Emily, Heather, Amanda, Miranda, for being willing to be so open and share your stories with us and um, using your stories as a catalyst for change and for helping others. It's very powerful, really important. And I know that just by you being here in this space and speaking, on behalf of the military experience, you're helping so many other families on this journey. So immense gratitude from Return to Zero Hope, and thank you to everyone who joined the webinar. We appreciate you being here as well. And I will keep it open for um, a few questions and answers if people want to stay on, including you as the panelists, because I know we are at time but I will give that option. We can stay on for those that are able and might have a couple questions. And Anita is um, gonna put her email into the chat and we, you can also direct any questions to Anita at Return Zero Hope as well. So again, such an informative session, really helpful for parents and providers. So immense gratitude, thank you so much. And we'll look forward to seeing um, people again in another Return to Zero Hope webinar. If you have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. And panelists, feel free to stay if you are able to. Also, I want to add my email just to the chat um, because I have a lot of, like, as a mental health provider, I have a lot of people reach out to me within the military community of, like, either seeking me out for services or helping point you in the right direction to mental health providers through the community, different communities, perinatal mental health communities that I'm a part of. Um, so I just want to put my email in the chat, like, for that. Um, cause I also know a lot about how do you work overseas? How do you like with all the different licensing that we've talked about here? So I just wanted to add that tidbit. Thank you, Emily. And Heather has put her information in there as well. And if anyone else wants to put your, um, platforms or email addresses or whatever, um, we are creating the community right here, right now. Amazing, Amanda, the only one. And thank you, Denisha, as well. Stephanie, I see. Are you asking about all the resources that have been put into the chat? We can do that. I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can help with? Oh my goodness, my phone. <laughs> Siri, not talking to you, Siri. Yes, we can do this. Anita can work on collecting the information and we'll find a way to get it out. Cool. Wonderful suggestion. And we also hope to have a RTZ page that is specific to military and resources as well. So
Cody, are you still on? Cody's on. And can people share in chat in the webinar? We'll have to get more information, Miranda. Maybe include that. So. Okay, thank you everyone so much for being here. Um, appreciate it. And we um, look forward to seeing you again in another space in another time. So thank you.